Good evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the Grace Life as we attempt to explain grace and attempt to how grace is applied. And what I like to say, Grace Life Unleashed. And uh, this, this new logo I put on the uh, church's website um, and it's also on the YouTube site. And it just says Grace Life. Uh, I love it. Uh, again, we are Berean Bible Church. Um, Grace Life and Grace Life Unleashed is, is just the same thing. Um, we are starting our first service. And, and this is a, a joint venture or partnering of our church and the YMCA of downtown Evansville. Uh, I spent two hours yesterday with the chaplain down there, nice, really nice guy. And we're gonna work together and uh, we're gonna supply the spiritual side. If people are looking for a church, I'm gonna be doing some volunteer chaplain work with them. We get a chance to meet the people who go to the Y and we're going to be inviting people who attend the Y and are involved in the Y to come to our church services. We're, we're gonna start a, and not yet, we're gonna have a, a Bible study once a week in-house down there. But our first church service is gonna be this Sunday, July 4th. And for those of you who are watching it, you know, later, that's, this is 2021, but the, the Y is located on 516 Court Street, brand new, uh, basically two years old. Uh, right next to the old Y downtown, if you know your way around Evansville. And this is an exciting. Um, the chaplain down there, um, he listened to a lot of our, our videos and he was shocked almost in the sense that we teach faith plus nothing. He told me a lot of churches add stuff to it and he was like a breath of fresh air. So I appreciate that and I'm excited about it. This is a new opportunity for our church, a new opportunity to expand our ministry. And, and to see tremendous results for the Lord. And, we, and that's exciting. And if you can help support that ministry, it's P.O. Box 6033, Evansville, Indiana, 47719. That, that stays the same no matter what. But this is, a, this is a permanent location. This is not a, well, for the next couple months we're going to be here. This is now our new home. We are inside the YMCA from 9.30 to 10.30 at Sunday School. 10.30, 11.30 is our worship service. So again, Grace Life Unleashed, and, and I, I love this, what this means. Um, it, it's explaining it. So many people, they have trouble with the application part of grace because they bring so much baggage in from the law, and I call that law light. You cannot live your life with law light. And light, you know, light anything. This is grace. We're trying to blend the two programs together. And we're going to see some of that tonight. Tonight we're going to talk about eternal security. I think one of the doctrines that makes grace so awesome, and I don't know if that's even a word, so amazing, in a sense so perfect, is that you cannot lose your salvation. Once saved, always saved. Now I've been accused of teaching easy believism and now I'm going to be accused of teaching eternal security. So it doesn't take a whole lot to be saved and you can never lose it. Where's the stick? There is no stick. This is God's gift to us, no strings attached. Do believers have eternal security? I believe in the dispensation of the grace of God that believers have eternal security. Now having said that, I do not believe, and this is where, where the rub is, and a lot of grace pastors disagree with me and a lot of them agree with me. It's kind of one of those 50-50 things. I do not believe that Old Testament saints had eternal security. Now I do believe, and you've got to follow me on this, I do believe that New Testament saints will. Now you go, oh, we're in the New Testament, no we're not. The New Testament or New Covenant does not start until Christ returns to set up his kingdom. And that has not happened. So this new um, thing that the Holy Spirit's going to be doing for New Testament saints is what will give them eternal security. And we saw a little bit of that in the beginning of Acts when the Holy Spirit came upon those believers, but that was pulled away as Israel was set aside. But today in the dispensation of grace, the last thing you need to worry about is whether or not you lost your salvation because of something you did, something you said, 
you know, whatever the case may be, um, you are not going to lose your salvation. God is true to his word. If you believe that Christ died on the cross for your sins, he was buried, he rose again, you're saved throughout eternity. So today in a dispensation of grace, we do have eternal security. And that's exciting. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to look back at some law passages. Passages that I think point to the fact that Old Testament saints did not have eternal security. And even going into the tribulation, tribulation saints did not have eternal security. The body of Christ is not the tribulation. The body of Christ is not spiritual Israel. The body of Christ is the body of Christ. In Matthew 10, 16 through 22. Um, this is Christ talking to his disciples. All right. Again, this is Christ talking to his disciples. He says, Behold, I send you forth as sheep into the midst of wolves. Be therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. So he's giving them, in a sense, their marching orders. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils, and they will scourge you, scourge you in their synagogues. All right, so you're going to be persecuted, you're going to be attacked, you're going to be whatever the word you want to do. You know, that's going to happen to you. He's telling you 12 that. And that ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for the testimony against them, and the Gentiles. Now, I do believe that Christ here is talking about the tribulation period, but it doesn't even really actually matter that much. It means after he's gone. Um, but this is a general reference because the tribulation was supposed to start. But when they deliver you up, take no thought of how or what you shall speak, or it shall be given you in that same hour what you shall speak. Now, th this, this verse in 19, I, I love this verse. What this verse tells us is that when the Holy Spirit came upon those disciples, he gave them supernatural knowledge and supernatural ability to know what to say and do. This is like going to take a test, having never studied for it and knowing all the answers. They're just there. You know, um, take no thought of what you shall speak or what shall be given unto you the same hour what you shall you know, speak. It, it's like God's going to tell them. So it's like taking a test you never studied for and getting a straight A. And so, in a sense, Christ is saying, don't worry about taking notes. Don't worry about understanding what's going on. The Holy Spirit is going to give you these words, and you're going to know exactly what's going on. And you're going to know exactly what to say. That's, that's kingdom power. That's not true in the dispensation of grace. God is not telling you what to speak. God is not giving you knowledge you do not have in a dispensation of grace. That's why Paul says, study to show thyself approved unto God. Whereas Christ is saying, don't bother studying. The Holy Spirit's going to give you all the answers. Very much of a difference. For it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. Praise the Lord. And the brother shall deliver the brother to death, and the father the child, and the children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put unto death. Again, I, I believe this is during the tribulation period where um, Christians are going to be turned in. And ye shall be hated of all men. Now, he's, again, he's talking to the twelve, but in, in a sense, he's talking to faithful Israel. For my name's sake. But he that, and this is interesting, endureth to the end shall be saved. And I remember growing up, and, and even you know, when I was an adult, I would say, well, what does it mean enduring to the end? Well, it means making it to the end. And what's the prize if you do it? You're saved. So let's, let's flip that. If you don't endure to the end, you're not saved. Now, does that mean you lost your salvation? Does that mean you never had salvation to begin with? See, a lot of pastors, they'll, they'll twist this around and say, no, you can't lose your salvation. These people were never saved to begin with. I almost think they were saved and they lost it. He said, well, give me an example in Scripture, Pastor, of somebody who was saved and lost their salvation. I have a great trophy of that. Adam and Eve. Were Adam and Eve not saved and then sinned and lost their salvation? Well, that, that's different. I, is it, you asked me for an example, I gave you one. I'm going to give you other examples, but I also believe that what Christ is telling the twelve was, if you guys don't stay faithful, you're going to lose your salvation. 
I think he's telling them that. And I think he's talking to Israel. And he's saying, Israel, if you don't stay faithful, you are not going to be saved. And it wasn't that they, they never were saved at all. I think the issue is they were saved and they lost their salvation. And we're going to show you, I think, scripture verse that proves this. Again, grace is not law and law is not grace. Quit trying to put a little bit of grace into the law. Saying, oh, Old Testament saints said eternal security just like we do. Well, in that case, what was the purpose of the law? They were saved anyways. Just do what you want. Who cares about the law. What was the stick? The stick was you're going to lose your salvation. The law never saved anyone. The law proved your faith. And I think if you lost your faith, you lost your salvation under the law. Not, not under grace. We don't live under the law. So don't go put a little bit of law in your life. Put no law in your life. You cannot lose your salvation. But these folks did. And, and the context here says that it, it, they do. If they don't endure to the end, they're not saved. And people say, oh, that, that's not soul salvation, that's physical salvation. I, that's, that's soul salvation, I do believe. All right, Revelation, this is during the tribulation. Revelation chapter 2, verse 25 through 27. These are the, the, the seven churches that John is writing to. And he says, but that which ye have already hold fast till I come. Okay, in other words, hang on to the doctrine I've given you. And he that overcometh, and, and the issue in Revelation is, hang in there, don't give up. Hang in there. Don't compromise, okay? Don't give up. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works, again, keep doing the works. Works didn't save you. Works proved your faith. He might as well have said, keep the faith, but you have to have works to prove your faith in this dispensation. Unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. So the issue seems like you got to hang in there and don't ever compromise. Because if you compromise and you give up, you're going to lose your salvation, okay? And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessel of a potter shall be then be broken into shivers, even as I received of my father. 28. I guess there is no 28 there. Okay. Revelation 14, 6. Again, another example. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. Now, I believe, and this is not why we're here, but people always told me, and, and I actually believed for a while, that the job of the 144,000 was to evangelize the world during the tribulation. I honestly don't see that anymore. I see the job of the 144,000 as those are the, the people that God sealed and that Satan can't hurt. In other words, they're guaranteed to go into the kingdom. It's kind of like a, you know, no touching these people. And God's God, he can make the rules, okay? So we have angels telling the world what to do. So who's going to do the evangelism during the tribulation? I think angels are. Because they're going to dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. And what are they going to tell these people? Saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him. For the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of the waters. All right, so here, fear God. It's not a good grace message, but it's, it's, it's more of a kingdom message, okay? And there followed another angel saying, Babylon has fallen, has fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. All right, so the issue is they followed Babylon, which is the Antichrist. They followed the anti-God. And a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, okay, it gets back to anti-God, anti-Father, anti-Son, anti-Holy Spirit. If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive what? His mark in his forehand or his, forehead or his hand. All right, so now it's saying, hey, believe in God, don't worship the beast. And now he, this, this third angel says, don't take the mark. Now, this is important. You follow me on this. Why, why, who cares about the mark? Well, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. If you take the mark... Now, I, I got into a discussion with a, a bunch of people once. Who's this written to? Okay, who, who's... The, the book of Revelation is written to the nation of Israel. 
because it's the time of Jacob's trouble. It's the last judgment that God is going to give Israel to see if Israel is faithful. It's not written to Gentiles. Okay? Now, the only problem I have is these angels are flying around talking to everyone, so it's a little bit difficult to figure out. I'm not convinced the judgment applies to Gentiles because God's talking to the Jews. He's saying, Jews, don't take the mark. But that's not even why we're there. The point we're here is in the sense of if you take the mark, okay, you're going to be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. This is not a purgatory issue where if you take the mark, we're going to beat you up for a couple thousand years and we're taking the mark and then we're going to let you go into the kingdom. This is you're going to the lake of fire. So the question is, up until the time that these people took the mark, were they saved and then they lost their salvation? Or were they never saved to begin with and so they just continue down that path and obviously they're not saved? I, I seem to think, and there's a lot of pastors that wiggle on this one and go, well, in the tribulation you can you lose your, your salvation, but not any other time. I'm like, what? You can't, you can't, you got to be consistent. So I believe this is, you know, this is just a failure to obey the law. And what God is saying is the law is trust God that he's going to take care of you. If you don't trust God, you take the mark, it proves a lack of works and it proves a lack of faith. You now lost your salvation. I think it's important. So important. So you want to endure to the end. The issue is hang in there till you die. You know, it, it's not like, hey, I accepted Christ at 14. I'm set to go. These guys were running a risk up until the day they died that they could lose their salvation by messing up and not obeying the law. Now, Hebrews 11, 1 through 13. Hebrews is a transitional book from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant. And I believe this section we're looking at is a reference back at the Old Covenant. Uh, the writer starts out by saying, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Now that's true in every dispensation. You believe whatever God tells you, not because you can see it, but because you believe it. For by it the elders obtained a good report. And he's going back to Israel. Through faith we understand the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen are, were not made of things which do appear. God spoke the universe into existence. That's what that's saying. By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gift, and by it bringing death yet speaketh. Now, Abel offered up unto God a more excellent sacrifice. Why was it a more excellent sacrifice? Because it was offered up by faith and not by works. Cain's sacrifice was probably just as good looking as, as Abel's was, it possibly even could have been better. Uh, you're like, what? I'm going to say it again. Cain's sacrifice was probably just as good, if not better looking, than Abel's was. But Cain brought his good works. Abel brought faith and what God told him to bring. Faith always saved you. Your works proved your faith. If God would have said, bring me a butterfly, then you would have had to bring him a butterfly. God said, bring me an animal. And what happened is Cain said, I've got something better than the animal. I've got something I did myself. I'm going to bring my good works, which is my fruits and vegetables. That's the difference. Faith never saved, I mean, works never saved you. It just proved your faith. A lack of works proved your lack of faith. What, all that Cain was showing God was that he needed, he was trying to help God with salvation. He was upping it. I can do better than God. I have something to give to God. I'm giving him something I did. By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God has translated him. For before his translation he had this testimony that he pleased God. So these these people were living right up until the point that they died, or in this case, Enoch went to heaven. Enoch never died. God took him. So the, so the issue is with Old Testament saints is, what are you doing not only now, but what are you going to do up until the point you die? Because up until the point you die, you have a chance of losing your salvation by messing up your works part of your faith. But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Verse 7. By faith Noah, 
Again, we're talking here about faith, and we're adding works to that, and then we're adding timeline to that. By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world, and because became heirs of the righteousness which is by faith. Noah was declared righteous because he did what God asked him to do, and then God declared him righteous. He obeyed him and did what God asked him to do. Uh, building a ark maybe physically saved him, but it proved his obedience to what God told him to do, and that's what saved him. By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should, after receive his inheritance, obeyed, and he went out not knowing whether he went. Okay, I trust you, Lord. I'm leaving my family. I'm leaving my kindred. I'm going to the land you're going to show me. Okay. By faith he sojourned, this is still Abraham, in the land of the promise, and it is a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs of which of the same promise. So that promise was moved on to the next generation and the next generation. For he looked for a city which had foundations, whose builders and makers God. That's a reference to New Jerusalem, which he had promised and not delivered on yet. Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed, and was delivered of a child when she was part, past age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. You know, even Sarah, and, I, and I've, I've been known to pick on Sarah over the years because she laughed at the angels when they told her she was going to get pregnant in a year. Um, and I understand that, but it, it says here she had faith. She believed God. Uh, she was a little bit reluctant, but I think she believed God. Therefore, sprang there even of one, and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky is multitude, and as the sands which is by the seashore immemorable. Okay, and what it's talking about is be, um, even though Sarah was unable to have children, she had a child, and now because of that faith, the number of people is going to be as the sands of the seashore, and uh, that will happen during the kingdom. Now this is why we did this whole passage, because this is strange writing. These all died in faith. Now, if, if you're once saved, always saved in the Old Testament or Old Covenant or the Law, whatever you want to call it, why would you write that? It would be just known. This is, assumes that it's possible to um, die not in faith. And I think the issue is these guys could have messed it up and lost their salvation if their works wouldn't approve their faith. There's always a chance you can mess up. Now, on the other hand, I also believe there was a, a possibility that you could set it straight again. You could get right with God again. I, I really believe that um, King Saul probably got his act together before he was killed. That, that's just my opinion. Some of you can disagree on that. I think he actually learned from his mistakes and then we use the word repented and got right with God before he was killed, although I could be wrong. But these all died in faith. So all these people, God's talking about how amazing they are, it says, and they made it all the way to death and still had their faith. Or in a sense, still had good works to prove they had their faith, because it's the law. What disqualified them was not a lack of faith, it was a lack of works that proved they didn't have the faith. And again, I know that gets complicated because it's like, what do you, what do you, it's, 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 just be glad you don't live in that dispensation, okay? Not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. They knew what was going on, okay? And that's so exciting. All right, but now we get to Romans. And the reason I want to jump to Romans, we're still going to go back and look at some law issues. But Paul comes along and says, What saith the Scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Boom. Abraham believed God. And, and where Paul is going is he's going to a time before God started adding works to Abraham's promise. Abraham believed God. He just did what God did. One. Now to him that worketh is a reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. Remember that. Yeah. But to him that worketh not, this is a representation to the dispensation of grace, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith, faith in what? Believing on him that justifieth the ungodly. And again, under grace, it's Christ died on the cross for your sins, was buried and rose again. 
we've been justified by God and we were ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. He said, well, shouldn't we have works to prove our righteousness? Not under grace. Now, I, I personally think it would be nice. Because <laughs> then I could tell easier whether or not somebody was living the way they believed. If that makes any sense. His faith is counted for righteousness. That's what makes grace so amazing. And that's why I love grace so much. All right, let's go back to Exodus. Okay? Now, this is a reference to when uh, Moses goes up and he gets the law, and while he's getting the Ten Commandments, the people are down there making a golden calf. Moses comes down and gets all mad at him, grinds the calf up, they drink it, a couple thousand people die as a judgment. And Moses is really a concern because he's afraid God's going to wipe them all out. And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses said unto the people, You have sinned a great sin, and I will go up unto the Lord. Preadventure I shall make an atonement for your sin. Now, we, we looked at the word atonement a couple weeks back, and uh, it's, a, it's a temporary covering to cover a permanent problem. It's like, hey, maybe we can do something to make God not hurt you. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Oh, this people have sinned a great sin and have made them gods of gold. Which is like, yeah, that's why God was mad at them. You know, one is, you know thou shalt have no other gods before me. He kind of violated that one. Yet now, and I understand what Moses is saying to God. If thou wilt forgive their sin, in other words, I will make a deal with you. And if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book which thou hast written. Now, and then this is always like a, well, was, did Moses know what he was talking about? Um, did Moses have precedence here? Had this happened before? Is it, could he even say that? What he's saying is, blot me out of the book which thou hast written. He's saying, I am willing to give up my salvation. I think for the people. I don't think he's saying if you're not going to save them, I don't want to be saved either. And, and that is a possibility, but I'm not quite sure what he's, he's saying. That. I think he's saying, hey, tell you what, I'll give up my salvation, just don't punish them. This is when Moses takes complete ownership of these people more than anything else. Now, is Moses asking something that God can't do? Like, Moses, you know the rules, you know I can't do that. Um, I think it's something that could happen. I think it was possible to lose your salvation in the kingdom program. And Moses knows that, and he's saying, tell you what, I'll give up my salvation for them. And the Lord said unto Moses, whosoever has sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. So in order to be blotted out of a book, you must have been blotted in. Because if you weren't in there to begin with, what are we blotting out? So that's always an interesting thought, too. You know, so did these people lose their salvation? And the important thing is, were they saved before? Because a lot of times what people say is, well, they never were saved to begin with. So there's no salvation to lose. They weren't saved. I'm saying they were saved, and now God blotted them out, and they were not saved anymore. That, that's where the part of eternal security does not play into the kingdom program at all. Verse 34 um, says, Therefore now go... Lead the people unto the place of which I have spoken unto thee. Behold, mine angel shall go before thee. Nevertheless, in the days when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. You know, God, he, God got mad at Israel, and he basically moved out of the camp and put an angel there to um, talk to him. He was, he was done with them more than anything else. Ephesians 1, 9 through 14. Now, this is grace. So we see what we're, we're reading in the Old Testament. It sounds like it's conditional. It sounds like you can be blotted out. It sounds like you can lose your salvation. That God's just like, hey, I'm done with you. And then Paul comes along with grace. And again, grace is once saved, always saved. Grace is you never can lose your salvation no matter what you do because your works have nothing to do with your faith. Now, I, I question once in a while how much faith you have in some of the, now I'm going to use the word stupid, in some of the things that people say. You kind of wonder once in a while, like, are you saved or not? Why would you say that? Um, but again, who am I to, it's, it's childlike faith. It, you believe Christ took your place, your punishment on the cross. He died for your sins. He was buried. He rose again. If you believe that, you're saved. I don't care if you don't understand anything more than that. You're saved. All right. In Ephesians 1, 9, Paul says, Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to the good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself. 
that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. I, I do not believe this is a new dispensation. Some pastors teach this is the final dispensation. This is the eighth dispensation. When God's going to take the kingdom saints and the body of Christ and he's going to lump them all together into one big family and stick them in New Jerusalem and we're all going to coexist and live happily ever after. That's he spends all this time separating them, and now he's going to throw them all together again. That's wrong. This is a, a the dispensation of the fullness of times is the completed form of, of the dispensation of grace. Because right now, half of the grace, and I use the word half loosely because it's not half, but half of the grace believers are where? They're dead and in heaven. Okay, The other half are here on earth. And that's why Christ has to bring the ones in heaven back with him to meet the ones here on earth and, and we all become one body at one time and we're unified. So I think what he's talking about, dispensation of fullness of times is a representation of when the dispensation of grace ends. God's going to gather those which are in heaven because they died already and those which are on earth because they hadn't died yet and um, bring them all together and put them in the body. I don't see this as a complete complete dispensation I see as a completed form of the dispensation of grace because right now we're kind of separating one from another. Now verse 11 says, in whom also we have re we have obtained an inheritance. Oh, remember we talked about, last week we talked about adoption and this feeds into that too. Being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. So these are our spiritual blessings. These are who we are in Christ and all this. That we should be the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. Verse 13. In whom you also trusted. All right. This gets into salvation. Faith plus nothing. You trusted. After that, you heard the word of truth. Okay. You heard the word. Christ died on the cross for your sins. He was buried and rose again. You trusted that. Okay. The gospel of your salvation. In whom also after that you believed. You know. Do you believe it or not? Do you believe that... Christ did all the work, he did all, he took your punishment and now you're saved. You were what? That moment you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. This is something the Old Testament saints did not have. Now I do see this happening at Pentecost where the Holy Spirit is coming upon people, but this is unique to the body of Christ. Under grace, the body of Christ comes upon you at the moment of salvation and seals you into the body of Christ. Okay, in in a sense, he makes sure he makes sure you don't lose your salvation. God moves into you. It's the best way to put it. He moved in. Now, what does this mean? Well, this is the earnest of our inheritance. What's our inheritance? We talked about adoption, heavenly realm. We're seated in the heavenlies. We're on the same level as Jesus Christ yourself, himself. We're, we're heirs and, and joint heirs with Christ. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that. We, God sees us just like he sees Christ. It, it's amazing the identification we have when we're adopted into God's family and what God sees. And the Holy Spirit moves into us because what? We don't have the redemption of the purchase possession yet. We're still here on earth. But to make sure God's good for what he, he is promising us, he, get, he put out a down payment. What was the down payment? The Holy Spirit. Now, when you buy a house, they kind of want 20% down. Do you know how much God put down to make sure that we know he's good for the rest of it? He put 100% down. He moved in to your body. And in order for God to kick you out of heaven, he'd have to kick himself out because he's now part of you. I believe at the moment of salvation, our spirit and God's spirit, in, in a sense, joined, fused. And that's why the old man's dead, and we're now the new man in Christ, and all these kind of things. We are now a child of God because the Holy Spirit lives in us, okay? And that's exciting. There's a lot of truth in that that makes it so, so exciting. 2 Timothy 2, 8 through 16. Remember that Jesus Christ, the seed of David, was raised from the dead according to my gospel. Now, Paul is reminding Timothy what his gospel is. Christ died on the cross for our sins. He was buried, and he rose again. There's a lot of people that believe this. And what they believe is that what this did was allowed us to be saved. Christ died on the cross for our sins, and now we're savable. And what we have to do is we have to do enough good works now to work our way to heaven. Folks, that's adding works to salvation. If you believe that Christ died on the cross for your sins, he was buried and rose again, you are saved at that moment, regardless if you are the best worker or the worst worker, because the works have nothing to do with your salvation. Your works had nothing to do, to do with you getting saved, 
And so obviously they have nothing to do with you losing your salvation. Thus, you cannot lose your salvation. God is good according to his word. That's so important. Wherein I suffer trouble. Okay, now, well, now Paul's getting real here. Guys, God didn't take away all my problems. I'm suffering trouble as an evildoer, even under bonds, but the word of God is not bound. God didn't promise us health, wealth, and prosperity. Therefore, I do all things for the elect's sake. Who's the elect? Body of Christ. The reason we're still here on earth after we're saved is because God wants us to get involved in leading other people to Christ. That's who the elect are. That they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. We are here on earth for evangelistic purposes. So let's start acting like evangelists. I don't like those people. You're not being an evangelist then. Do you think Paul liked everyone he ran into? Do you think Christ, you know, sometimes it was an endurance? Yeah, some people are difficult. Verse 11. It's a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. I guess it's identification doctrine. This is Romans 6 type stuff. This is baptism type, type stuff. When Christ died on the cross, we died there with him. Christ took our sins upon him. That was us. So we died. We were buried. And we rose again. Your sins are paid for. Your sins are paid for. Now, they were paid for through Christ, but that was you. That was your sins. That was us. It's done. That's why this is so exciting. It's done. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. Now, I believe this is talking about rewards in a sense. As you suffer for Christ, you're going to get rewarded for that, as in positions of authority within the heavenly realm or something like that. Then Paul says that we deny him, he also will deny us. What does that mean? I believe it's a loss of rewards. It's not loss of salvation. It says you didn't get that reward because you didn't really do anything. But you're still going to heaven. You're still going to be in heaven. And because there's no pride in heaven, it's not like someone's going to be lording it over you. You're still going to heaven. This is an encouragement to do the, the will of God, do good works because of the reward you're going to get in heaven. But again, it's not salvation. If we believe not, yet he abides faithful. This is eternal security. We change our mind. Yet who is he? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. He cannot deny himself. In order for God to kick you out of heaven, he's going to have to kick himself out because he now lives in you and you're bound and you can't, you can't separate that anymore. That's the most amazing thing about grace that should make you smile, should make you content, and make you peaceful. There's nothing you can do to lose your salvation. And also remember, folks, salvation is not a feeling. Not that there's not feelings involved. Salvation is a fact. And with that fact comes an attitude. And with that attitude should come emotion. But don't let emotions lead the train. The facts lead the train. The emotion comes behind. Let's get our facts straight and live our emotional life in light of those facts. That's so important. How many people live their day-to-day -day lives by their emotions? How do you feel today? Of these things, put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. People get involved in arguments over stuff that's so relevant. And then he says, study. Remember earlier where Christ said, don't worry. Don't worry about studying. When the Holy Spirit comes, he's going to give you all the words you need to know. And he's going to give you the words to say. Paul comes on the scene and says, you've got to study. What do you got to study? God's word. Study to show yourself approved unto God. Basically, Paul is saying, so study because you've been approved unto God. Because of who you are in Christ, don't you want to study this and know who you are? This is ident identification politics or uh, adoption politics or identification doctrine, whatever you want to call it. Study your Bible so you know who you are in Christ. Study your Bible so you know what God's doing today in the dispensation of grace. And, and study so you know what he's not doing today. God can do anything. Yeah, but he's choosing not to do a few things. You need to know the corners, I call it. Okay? So study because you've been approved of God and because you're a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. You know, you ever call a guy up, he's... He's supposed to work on the sea. He's supposed to put a new shingles on your roof. And he shows up and he goes, you know, 
I'm going to have to get my phone out and YouTube this because I've never done shingles before. Are you going to let this guy work on your roof? You want a guy who knows how to do it. He's done it already. Um, he, he, he's aware of how to do it right. And then so it's done correctly. You know, you're going to live your grace life correctly. Don't you think you should look at the uh, owner's manual and figure out what's going on? And how are you going to do it? You're going to rightly divide the word of God. You're going to dispensationally divide the word. The dispensation of grace is not replacement theology. You say, what, what's that? There's a doctrine out there that says that the body of Christ replaces Israel. All the promises God gave to Israel, he's now given to the body of Christ because God basically is through with Israel. Folks, God's not through with Israel. He's just set them aside. And the body of Christ is not spiritual Israel. Oh, we're Jews by, you know, in the sense of a spiritual realm. No, we're not. We're not Jews. We're the body of Christ. There are no Jews in the body of Christ. There are no Gentiles in the body of Christ. We're just nothings, I guess you could say. But shun provane and vain babbling, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. Good, quit fighting with people is how I look at that. In summary, Jesus did all the work, and there is nothing left for us to do. To be forgiven, except believe in him. Isn't that exciting? So I, I really see in the Old Testament where, to where Old Testament saints, not only if they didn't have the works to prove their faith, they would lose their salvation, and God would blot them out. But I also think that with the sacrificial system, they could actually get right with God and get a new start. But the key was, make sure when you die, you're right with God. Because there's no second chances if you're wrong with God and you pass away. That's so important. So as far as eternal security goes, the dispensation of grace, and if I had to pick one thing that I would want us to grab onto, it's understand eternal security. Because it should create in you an attitude that would just make your day. Let's pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, as we think of grace, Lord, we think of so many exciting things. We ask now, Lord, for um, grace and peace and all, all those things we need to live the grace life. And again, we pray all this in your name. Amen.